Hello, this is uh, time for part three of this series. Uh, hope you enjoy. So what's the problem with the New Testament? The problem is, very simply stated, that the mechanism that God set up did not let them pass through. Meaning, the people who wrote the New Testament, whoever they were, were not acknowledged by our sages as legitimate prophets. As a matter of fact, prophecy ended. Prophecy ended in Israel about 450 BCE. So by the first century of the Common Era, if someone tells you, God spoke to me, I'm a prophet, well, you'd probably say, I, I don't think so, buddy. We don't have any more prophets. And if we were going to have prophets, it would only be because the leading sages of any generation would say, yes, we think that you are really a prophet. So this really could have been the end of the lecture tonight. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Because that really is checkmate. It's checkmate. <clears throat> Okay, we know uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, by Jewish tradition, son and half by King Manasseh. Uh, we know that the prophet Jeremiah was greatly opposed by the king. Uh, he had to sit in the mire under the city. And there are a lot of stories of prophets. Uh, here's a uh, about Elijah, First uh, Kings chapter twenty, First no, Kings chapter nineteen, verse uh, oh verse nine, where Elijah went to the cave after uh, slaying the prophets of Baal and being threatened by Jezebel. Jezebel and Ahab were the leaders at that time. So he went there in the cave, into a cave, and there he spent the night. Then the word of the Lord came to him, and, he, and said to him, Why are you here, Elijah? He replied, I am moved by zeal for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have first torn down your altars and put your prophets to the sword. I alone am left, and they are out to take my life. So it's not always the case that the leaders know who the prophets are, or that the leaders support the prophets. Um, as the time went on, I think it's more the case that they opposed the prophets. And the idea that we'll, there will never be another prophet. Well, if we look at the very last um, chapter ever given in the Tanakh, um, as far as the chronology of the prophets goes, is, would be the prophet Malachi. He was the last known prophet in the Tanakh. And in the last chapter of Malachi, he says, Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can hold out when he appears? For he is like a smelter's fire and like a fuller's lie. He shall act like a smelter and a purger of silver. And he shall pur purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. <clears throat> So this sounds like um, there's going to be some opposition to this prophet that comes from the sons of Levi. Um, 
Um, now in the very last verse of the book of Malachi, verse 23, Lo, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the coming of the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. He shall reconcile parents with children and children with parents, so that when I come, I do not strike the whole land with utter destruction. So, um, you know, this idea that it's this happy-go-lucky thing that uh, the leaders of Israel have always welcomed the prophets with a red carpet is a fantasy. Um, they have not always well. In the beginning, uh, you know, under Moses and leading up into David, yes, it was very common for that to be the case. And uh, but as things descended from there, um, the prophets suffered more and more persecution. So, you know, this idea that just because they are the leaders, that they do everything so great, is not always the case. There, um, there's going to be a purging by a prophet. So, um, that is not a happy-go-lucky time. That is a, a time of persecution and opposition. So, <clears throat> you know, as long as the, what this rabbi is saying is as long as the prophet agrees with them, then he can be a prophet. But if he does not agree with them, then he cannot be a prophet. That's uh, very rarely been the case with prophets. Um, usually prophet, uh, God will send a prophet when they are um, going astray. And, and so when they are going astray, they are more likely to disagree with the prophets. Um, so I have shown that, yes, indeed, there are more prophets um, after the finalization of the Tanakh, um, and that uh, most likely they would be opposed because um, they don't always agree with the leadership. It's just as simple as that. And just as Jesus um, came head to head with the leadership because he did not have any interest in um, their interest. Um, like he cleared the uh, temple of the money changers. Um, there shouldn't have been money changers even in the temple. Um, they were profiteering from the people coming to the temple to make sacrifices. So, um, you know, that's politics. And every politician will always say that, uh, listen to me. Um, but it's not always the case. It's just a simple fact. Now, what is the credibility of the New Testament? First of all, we know one thing, that if God really wanted to make it clear to us that there was a new ball game and a New Testament, God could have very easily spoken publicly to the Jewish people because a lot of Jewish people were living in the land of Israel. They were going to the temple. God could have showed up at the temple and said, look, Jews, I know it's been 450 years since the last prophet. I got a big one for you, a New Testament, a whole new ball of wax, and it could have been a public revelation. We know that that didn't happen. Yes, it did happen. The New Testament records several events that happened. God speaking from heaven. When Jesus was crucified, the sun going dark. Uh, for three and a half years, Jesus went about all of Judea healing people. And uh, 
they refuse to listen to him. And <clears throat> since the uh, Sanhedrin refused to listen to him and they threatened anybody who did listen to him, then people uh, could not stand up against them. And they all just went along with it. And that's the, uh, that's what happened. And they didn't record it. You want, you want to know why they didn't record it? Because it was an embarrassment to them. The same reason for this, why in Ezekiel, in this new English translation of the Tanakh, in Ezekiel, such a simple phrase, Ben Adam, it's been translated as son of man for, it's been translated that way. But you can't take to have that. You have to say, oh, mortal. So all we have with the Christian Bible are the authors of these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, Titus. And they're claiming what are they claiming? They're claiming not that we made up these books on our own. I just wrote this wonderful book of fiction. They're claiming that this is revelation. They're claiming that this came through prophecy, through God. Now we know that they didn't get the revelation publicly. We know they didn't even present their writings in Hebrew. Hebrew is our holy language. They're presenting these writings in Greek. Why all of a sudden is God speaking to the Jewish people in Greek? Actually, the best evidence suggests that um, the original writing of the New Testament were in Aramaic. Or possibly Paul wrote uh, a lot of his in Greek because he uh, was his ministry was more up around uh, in Anatolia. But um, Jesus and the first apostles most likely spoke Aramaic, and uh, <clears throat> the first stories were written in Aramaic. Uh, what you have to understand is that this revelation is a different kind of revelation than uh, the revelation through Moses and the, and the Hebrew prophets. This is something new that God is doing. Um, and it's more tuned to the Holy Spirit that Jesus, what Jesus did when he came to the earth, he, it was more geared to something changing in the spiritual realm, um, and pouring out of the Holy Spirit of God into the heart of man like uh, we read earlier about the new covenant where he will uh, write his law on their hearts and so it's a different thing in that these men with the law written on their hearts reported what they had seen and um, the the uh, the accounts of the history were written a little bit later on because it the, this this revelation is coming out of the heart of men, but it's men who have been uh, impermeated with the spirit of God on their hearts. So this is. Uh, the, the 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 way that this one works and so it sort of comes out as a uh, grassroots movement um, and this is the way God chose it to be uh, much different than the revelation through Moses and and the growing up of a nation this is uh, I guess it's God taking the uh, sheep away from the shepherds, as he said he would. What do Christians do with the Book of Mormon? 
What do Christians do with the Book of Mormon? Because the same claim that Christians are making to us, Mormons are making to Christians. Everyone understand that? So again, the Christian comes to us and says, look, Rabbi Skoback, you know, your Bible's going to get a little bit bigger because it's not just, you know, from Genesis until uh, Chronicles. It really includes all these books from Matthew to Revelation. That's the claim the Christian makes to us. And the Mormon says to the Christian, look, uh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, Pastor so-and-so, the Bible now includes the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and Doctrines and Covenants. So I have in my library about a dozen books written by Christian theologians, and they try to explain why they don't accept the Book of Mormon. So I said, you know what? That sounds like good approach to me. The basic criteria that they used was, do the Book of Mormon, do the Mormon scriptures, are they consistent with what the Christian Bible teaches? But if you go back to the to second passage here, Deuteronomy 13, let's read it together. When a prophet or a person who has visions in a dream arises among you and produces a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes about of which he spoke. So here's someone that is making a prediction, and the prediction comes true. And they say, let us follow other gods that you did not know, and we shall worship them. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer of dreams, for Hashem your God is testing you. Because you could ask the question, wait a minute, if this guy is a false prophet, why would God give him the ability to do miracles? So the Bible here says, because God is going to be testing you to see if you're going to follow some guy that can do amazing magic tricks or you're going to listen to God. So God says he's testing you to know whether you love Hashem your God with all your heart and all your soul. Hashem your God you shall follow and him you shall fear. His commandments you shall observe and to his voice you shall hearken. So the two issues that are brought up here in Deuteronomy 13 the two things that the Bible focuses on that it does not want us to be misled about, even if someone can perform amazing miracles, is we should not worship a God that we didn't know. We should not turn to a God that we never heard about before, a new God. And we should not stop observing the Torah commandments. Jesus was preaching the exact same God as the Hebrew prophets. And he didn't change the law at all. In fact, he said the law will never change. Heaven and earth shall pass away before one tiny jot or tittle in the law will change. So it's not a God that you did not know. It's a God that you do know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's supported by the prophets, by the Hebrew prophets. God told way long ago, after the destruction of Jerusalem, mostly through Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the prophets after that, um, he began to tell in great detail about Jesus and the apostles. So it's not a different God, and it's not a different law. Now, some Christians may um, seem to make you believe that, but you can't look at people are doing who claim to be Christians to judge the New Testament. You have to look at the New Testament yourself and see what it says. Because not everybody who says they follow it actually follow it. Um, there, it it's, a, it's a different dynamic than uh, the Jews. You see, when Israel was a nation in ancient times, it was a warfaring nation. It had a king. It had a land it had it was like the other nations but a, and it was at war with other nations and they had their system 
to uh, protect themselves, their government, and their system. Um, Christianity is something that is more designed for people that will be scattered through the earth. Uh, that um, something they can carry with them on the move. So uh, it's not. It's a little bit different, and um, it's also uh, designed to be able to be adopted by nations, which some nations have done so. But um, you know, not everybody follows it exactly as it should be followed. So you can't judge it by them. You judge them by it. There's just one more thing I'd like to add to all of this. This rabbi, in this part, he seems to think that God is gone, God has left them in charge, and you don't have to worry about anything, just do what they say, listen to them, they will uh, decide for you. They're the sages, they're the top leaders, and they will tell you who to listen to, who not to listen to, and everything's fine. And the problem with that is this is what every cult says. Every cult on earth, including the major religions, which are very cultish, because they all say that. Even the small uh, Christian communities say that. Oh, you just listen to us, just listen to us. Um, very few will teach you to think for yourself. Now, <clears throat> at the, the, I have a final uh, Bible reading regarding the uh, that there will never be any more prophets, and that uh, you should not listen to anyone who says there are prophets, and uh, that kind of idea. If we look at Joel, chapter two. Um, Joel was a prophet. Uh, he he prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. And now we know now this is a cycle. It's happened twice already. There's going to be a third time. It's a cycle. So what we want to do is learn this cycle. Is how does it start and how does it end? And in Joel here, God talks about the early rain and the latter rain. That's also a cycle. It's a cycle of the seasons. And in Israel, the early rain is when they planted crops. And the latter rain would come just before the harvest. That would that the latter rain would ripen the crops and bring bring the fruits out. And then they would harvest. So it's again we're looking at a cycle, the cycle of the seasons. Uh, the seasons in Israel, in particular, um, is how uh, the Bible is describing things. So, let's take a look at Joel, chapter 2. Um, see, starting in verse 21. Still using this. Fear not, O soil. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has wrought great deeds. Fear not, O beasts of the field, for the pastures in the wilderness are clothed with grass. The trees have borne their fruit, fig tree and vine have yielded their strength. O children of Zion, be glad. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the earth for he has given you the early rain in his kindness. For a Christian, the early rain is the Jesus and the apostles. It's the rain pouring out of the Spirit of God on the people. Okay, And then there's going to be a latter rain to bring the crop to, to fruition before the harvest. Okay? For he has given you the early rain in his kindness. Now he makes the rain fall as formerly, the early rain and the late. And threshing floors shall be piled with grain, 
and vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years consumed by swarms and hoppers, by grubs and locusts, the great army I let loose against you, and you shall eat your fill. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who dealt so wondrously with you. My people shall be shamed no more, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Now who is Israel? There's a lot of questions about that. Israel is God's people. However you define that, Israel is God's people. That I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other, and my people shall be shamed no more. After that, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Now, do the rabbis have to approve this? Are they going to say, oh, let's hear what they say. We will approve all of these people. I will even pour out my spirit upon male and female slaves in those days. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So what is the great and terrible day of the Lord? Um, there are three of them, actually, that so far that I know of. The first one was the destruction by Babylon in ancient times. The destruction of Jerusalem. That was the great and terrible day of the Lord. <clears throat> the second was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. That was the end of the end of certain races of people. Uh, that was like the latter reign for the Jews, early reign for the Christians. It's like a beginning of a new cycle. And uh, then the third great and terrible day of the Lord will be the end of the world, the, the final second coming of Christ. Okay, so then, okay, listen to this now. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will set portents in the sky and on earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall turn into darkness, and the moon into blood. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape. For there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. As the Lord promised, anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. Okay. For lo, in those days and in that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will contend with them over my very own people, Israel, which they scattered among the nations. So see, this, this brings it past um, the other two destructions because this part has not happened. This is this is like Armageddon. So uh, this uh, scattering into the nations and coming back, this uh, this has not been fulfilled. So thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next video. Shalom.